some history. All right, go back into some history here. I'm going to bring you back, Mr. McGee, to 1983, okay? At Super Bowl 17. Super Bowl 17. Uh, you Redskins fans, you know what happened in Super Bowl 17, right? Okay, you know what happened. But there was a point in that game where y'all were down. Okay, were y'all down, down for a short period of time? And what I would like you to share with us is not only that experience, Mr. McGee, but also how did you come back and how did you end up prevailing in that? And how can we learn from something that you experienced for CFC? Well, and that's a very good question. And, and I'm thinking about the comments that were just made. And you put it in perspective of football in that game. And right now, you guys are in the second half. And that's where it was like that with us. And everyone thought that uh, Miami was going to win the game. And there was one big play in the game made by one individual, a defensive play made by a quarterback that saved the game, Joe Theismann. And it was a pass thrown. And the linebacker was about to catch it and go in. We were behind by about 10. Uh, 10 points at that time, had he caught that, we'd have been down by 17 points. Joe knocked that ball away. Everything turned around, Riggins make the big run, but had he not knocked that ball away, we never would have won that game. Now think about yourself with the CFC campaign. Any one of you guys can make a big play. You don't know what time of the year, what time of the day it'll be, or what time of the month, or time of the week. $12 a month, I can give up an order of my chicken wings for that, <laughs> okay? I, even though I do about 25 of them a month, as you can see. But at the same time, it's like football and anything, football now, football before. You have to make a commitment, and that's what I think Gary will tell you later on. When you're in a Super Bowl and you win one of these, I got three things that I always think you have to do. First of all, you have to make a commitment. That's what we're asking you to do for the campaign. And a commitment means you're going to be there throughout, not just for today, not just for tomorrow, but throughout. But a commitment is like anything else. If you just make a commitment and then you walk away from it, but you got to dedicate yourself to that commitment. Now, every year on the 26th of December, I dedicate myself to losing 10 pounds the next year. On the 4th of January, I've gained 10 pounds. <laughs> so I'm not dedicated enough. So you got to, when you make a commitment, you got to dedicate it. I'm just telling you, I, I, I'm telling you about 10, I really gained 15. But <laughs> if you dedicate yourself, you make that commitment, you dedicate yourself. But the last part of that, and that's for the game, and I know I've gotten away from it, is sacrifice. Right now, it's tough for everyone, but we all can work together. And that's what happened in that game. We all sacrificed our own game. We did what we needed to do as a team, and we came back, and that's why we're wearing these rings. Gary Clark has two or three of them. It's always a team effort, and if you do not have that team effort, it will not happen. You are a team. You're in the second half, and this is your Super Bowl. Thank you, Gary. And I'm going to tell you, before I, before I do, I do have some, some questions that, uh, for uh, Mr. Clark, but before I get to you, Mr. Clark, I, I want to throw one in thing in there because I'm going to go to uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Hopkins uh, for, for a moment, but before I do get to her, I'm going to tell you that uh, Mr. Clark knows something about sacrifice too, and I'm just going to give you a heads up. I'm going to talk about how you're talking about a, a, a gentleman that's over there that played pro football for 11 years and only fumbled the ball twice wow. in 11 years, but we'll get to that. We'll get to that in a moment. We'll get to that in a moment. Yeah, just twice. Yeah, according to the NFL.com. I remember one. I don't remember the two. <laughs> I'm feeling kind of bad about that. Right. Uh, let's go to the videotape. No, okay. Okay, but before we get to you, Mr. Clark, I'd like to uh, uh, brag a little bit about my sister here, my baby sister, uh, Donna Hopkins. She didn't know I was going to call her my baby sister, but that's okay. Um, but a quick, quick thing, uh, Ms. Hopkins is someone, and if you've read her bio, you've been online, you've seen that, but I just want to highlight a couple of things. You're talking about a remarkable woman that's in front of you, all right? Um, she was running a race about me, I think it was about uh, 12 years ago. It's about 12 years ago she was running the Coleman race for breast cancer uh, here in the D.C. area, and shortly thereafter, 
uh, after the race, she was diagnosed with breast cancer after she had felt a lump uh, while she was doing a, a, a self-examination. And um, the reason why uh, Donna's a remarkable, remarkable woman in that regard, not only did she survive that uh, uh, cancer through exercise and through uh, fitness and things of that nature, but she also survived a second onset of cancer. And so what I'd like uh, you, Donna, if you could share with everyone what you learned from that and how we could benefit from CFC and maybe tell them about some of the things you did with your charity that started as a, as a result of that. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I, I always say that uh, cancer is not the winner. I am the winner. Um, and we talked about sacrifices and things that we can do to make things better. And I realized that going through breast cancer twice, and uh, many of you all don't know, even last year I went through another situation where I lost part of my left leg going through an unforeseeable medical disaster. But in all saying that is that I'm just blessed to be among you today. So as, as I tell you that I am the winner and not the things I've been through. So um, going through all those things made me really appreciative of what I can do to give back to the community. And um, and a lot of a lot of times we go through things and we wonder why we go through things. But the good thing about all of that is is that uh, if I hadn't gone through breast cancer, I never would have started my foundation that gives back to the local communities for breast cancer survivors of people who cannot afford. So this is a very special time for me with the CFC and what it does because the thing about it, all of us is that we never know when we may be in a situation like that that we need help. And um, going through that is I learned that a lot of people are out here and the CFC is a lot of great organizations out there that gives back to the community. Uh, as they said before, a dollar or two dollars and three dollars. I'm not like Tony that, you know, need to lose those 10 pounds. Uh, uh, <laughs> 20. <laughs> 20 pounds and so forth, or the fumble two, two, two balls or so forth. But in saying... <laughs> And, and, and you know what? I was an all-star basketball player, too, with scholarships in basketball and track when I was in college. So I know what hard work is. I know what it takes, the sacrifices and the dedication and so forth. So all of us, you know, here today, uh, friends and families or somebody, we know somebody that has suffered through some of those uh, organizations in that book, that thick book. And it's somebody in there that touches all of our hearts. So uh, I was flipping through myself, and even though my foundation is in there, I don't give to my own foundation when CFC comes up because what I want to do is help those other organizations uh, to, to give back. And it's a lot that are dear to my heart because of family issues and other friends that may be going through things. So <clears throat> I challenge all of you all today as far as to give something. Uh, to dedicate yourself, the, the hard work that goes into all these campaigns each year, uh, the money that will help out a lot of things. So as I say, you be the winner today. You be the winner throughout this campaign in giving back so that you can stand tall and say that you hold the gold medal of life in helping others. Uh, with what they're going through. And uh, for those people who may not be able to thank you personally, know that it is going to worthy causes and a lot of people are being helped from uh, all that you do. And as I say that, um, I probably can beat Tony. You know, he's always challenging me in basketball and so forth. So I want you all to watch because sooner or soon, it's very soon, we're going to have a shootout. And I know that all of you all will be on my team. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tony. And I've, I've got a question now, uh, something I want to uh, do now with uh, uh, Mr. Clark. And like I did with the last Wait, round. Bring up more fumbles? No, no, no more fumbles, <laughs> sir. No more fumbles. But uh, before I get to you, and I, like I did, I want to leapfrog just to whet someone's appetite, everyone's appetite with Mr. Baker. Um, we're going to get to you in a moment, Mr. Baker, because they call you the, the genius, the sports marketing genius is what you're quoted as. Uh, according to USA Today, and they even called you the Mad Mike, the mouthpiece of the NCAA maniac. So 
you, you just get ready because we're coming to you. But now we, we've got something for Mr. Clark. And for, for those of you who don't know, uh, Mr. Clark was a two-time Super Bowl winner, four-time Pro Bowler, two-time Redskin MVP, four-time All-Pro, eight-time Madden team, member of the All-Madden team. I mean, I can go on and on. You know, you can pull that. And yes, it did have those two fun fumbles. <laughs> But that, yeah, no, that was two separate games, but, but that's it. But we'll check those stats. But that's the, that's the only blemish. I think that was a preseason game. I, I have someone in the I audience that says it. preseason games or scrimmages. Okay, yes, sir. Yes, From sir. my childhood. Yes, sir. It, as in the military, we always say, that's your story and you're sticking with it. <laughs> All right, sir. But, but, Mr. Clark, what I'd like you to share with us, uh, as everyone knows, and you were one of the most prolific receivers in the history of NFL football. And I'm going to tell you, you're near and dear to my heart, regardless of what jersey I have on, because you're, when I was standing next to you, you're about 5'10". You're about my height. Uh, I'm only about 155 pounds. You're about 180 or so. So it, you, you inspired me because I said, you know, I, maybe I could have done this, you know. <laughs> but... Yeah, I, I think maybe, you know, it, it, you kind of pumped me up. So what I'd like you to uh, share with the audience, you know, I know you've gotten a lot of that with all your uh, great accolades and your accomplishments. We're down. We're, we're right now, we're at halftime. What would you say right now to the uh, folks that are here? And remember, this is being broadcast across the United States and other locations. What could you say about uh, someone doubting you because of your size or who you are and that kind of thing and how... You turn that around and turn that into a positive. I think, really, it's, a lot of it's similar to like, the philosophy you guys have for at CFC. Is, it's all about commitment, focus, and dedication, quite honestly. I reveled in having challenges. Someone challenges me to do something. I like taking those challenges on. And For the most part, when I first came into the NFL, I weighed 155 pounds, so you could play. <laughs> I weighed 155 pounds. I played at 174 pounds. As you kindly pointed out, I look like I'm around 180, 190 now. You could have left that part out. That's what NFL.com yeah, had a you bit more weight. I put up a little bit more weight, obviously. But um, I think for the most part, it's being committed to whatever task at hand that you have. If I put a task in front of me, I like to work towards achieving it. And unfortunately, a lot of times we get distracted. A lot of people get distracted. I tell a lot of kids, if your vision and your dream is to become a professional football player, don't let anybody knock you off your dream. What happens is we get sidetracked. We have this road that we need to go to commit to making our dream come a reality. And a lot of times, all these outside influences come, in, come into place and it distracts us. Those people who stay focused and follow the path, they tend to acquire their goal. Those who get sidetracked tend to not acquire their goal because they got sidetracked. As a young kid, I knew what I wanted to do. At five and a half years old, I sit my father down at the kitchen table and told him that I wanted to play professional football. I told him that. And um, he kind of had a smile on the face. He didn't laugh. Thank God he didn't laugh. <laughs> but he kind of had a smile on his face. But he saw that I was serious about what I was saying, what I was, what I was committed to. But being a good father, he made sure that I knew that, okay, the task that you put before yourself is a huge task. Not a lot of people make it. And the reason that they don't is they're not focused to the task that they've asked themselves to complete. And those words allow me to understand that I got to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, even though I am a little bit over, I'm almost six years old, to go do my road work every day from the time that I played to the time that I stopped playing. Because when I stopped playing, I stopped running. <laughs> when the sun was over, I was like, Dad, I don't need to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning anymore and run. But my task was to be complete. My task was always to make myself the best player that I could possibly be. Then there'd be no excuses at the end of the day. I'd have no excuses on why I didn't make it. I, did, I don't like when people make excuses up. If you didn't make it because you did everything that you could, that's one thing. But if you didn't make it because you decided to try to take the easy way out, that's a whole nother thing. So what I like about CFC is you guys are committed to getting your goal. 
His goal is 850,000. He talked to a lot of other individuals who surpassed their goal. That's the type of focus that you need to play professional football. That's the type of focus you need to be a member of CFC and to commit. The people who've came out here today, I tell you right now, they're going to commit to your guys' tasks. They're going to pick out something that they care about, they're passionate about, and they're going to support it. That's really easy to do. Support what you're passionate about. At some point in time, we all need help from other influences. Everybody here on this panel that I've worked with, we've helped each other out in times when we needed to help each other out. I'm just glad to be a part of today. I mean, there's a lot of other people y'all could have asked to be here. I understand Art Monk was your first choice. <laughs> I'm not saying anything, but I understand that Art was your first choice, so. You had a, like a, a thing for a 225 pounder clothing and something for a small guy to come out here. Then I understand Ricky Sanders was your second choice. And I was like fifth, but that's okay, I'm here. I'm glad I was in fifth place <laughs> because I had those two fumbles and you allowed me to come here. But again, I'm just glad to be a part of this, a part of this panel right here. I'm, I'm glad to be a part of the vision that you guys have at CFC and I look forward to helping out in any way that I can and doing what I do best to push forward in the cause to just help. It's just that simple. We just should help your fellow human being. You should just help out where you can. And then, you know, I'm sitting beside this Emmy guy, so I'm going to let you brag on him now. Because you didn't brag on me. You bragged on Donna. You bragged on Mike. You bragged on Tony. And you said I had two fumbles. Those cowboys, <laughs> I swear. Thank you very much, Mr. Clark. And I don't know if the, I don't know whether the camera can do a close-up on this, but this is a photo of when, when, when Mr. Clark talked about doing whatever he can in the community. About two weeks ago, and he didn't, again, I like to surprise my guests. He's trying to see what photo yeah, what it is. You got, you got it's a photo of you in some original fashions by Eric Finn, custom clothers, uh, at a fundraiser that he did uh, to fight against domestic violence against women. Okay, and they did a fundraiser. Becky Sons, and, uh, great organization. You, you're, looking, you're looking pretty sharp there, sir. I, I, I well, say. you know, my mom did tell me I was a good-looking guy. She did. <laughs> <laughs> she told me that. I hope she wasn't fibbing to yes, me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank hey, you. Steve, you, are you sure when you stood next to Gary and you saw his side, you weren't saying, I could take this guy? <laughs> um, is, is that, it was, that, was that on your mind? Mr. Mr. McGee, I was a, a cross-country and track guy in uh, undergrad and, and high school, so... Uh, I could take them probably in a in a ten mile run that kind of thing, but I wouldn't want I wouldn't want to try. I you could take try. me in a two hundred mile I mean a two hundred yard walk. As you could tell. Me. <laughs> <laughs> I saw his six pack. I saw my one pack. I, I, I'm very. <laughs> and I got a cage. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, I might be true. And the other thing, Steve, since we're among friends, you know. I noticed, I told you I was 12 years old when I started this show. Yes, sir. Now, you called Donna, Donna. You called Mike, Mike. You called Gary, <laughs> Gary. And you called me Mr. McGee. I'm not your father. <laughs> okay? Let's get that straight. Yes, I'm sir. not your father, okay? Hold, hold on, Tony. Hold on, Tony. I'm you older wasn't... than your father. Hold on, Tony. <laughs> hold on, Tony. There was somebody here in the audience today, and I would like for her to come up front who said that you look like Bernie Mac. So could we have an individual? <laughs> Please come up. I hear this Come on up, come on up front. I want, I want you to see because the first thing she said, she said, that looks like Bernie Mac. <laughs> and this is the beautiful young lady that said that for you. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you know what? She thought I was reincarnated. Sometimes when we're in the airport, my wife and myself, and so many people say that she'll be at the other end of the hall and she said, Bernie! <laughs> <laughs> <Not that. laughs> I, I told Tony he could play Bernie Mac. I mean, on the show, I told him that he should actually play him. I just needed Bernie Mac's money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, man. Um, Mr. Baker, Mr. Baker, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the end of the little introduction I had for you because at the end of it, and this is something that's near and dear to me because I'm a service disabled vet as well. Right. And uh, Mr. Baker uh, is a service disabled Vietnam era veteran that's here with us today. <laughs> and um, 
And I'm also, I'm reading his bio backwards, but I joked with him just before the segment. Um, he has played, any of you remember uh, Don Quixote? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. Baker has played Don Quixote. But now when you go to the be uh, beginning of the bio, this is the important thing. You're looking at a seven-time Emmy Award winning TV host, reporter, okay, producer. He's also been nationally recognized as a videographer, um, honored by five videographer awards. He has other work. He's uh, received presidential uh, awards from National Arts Television. Where, excuse me, he's the president of National Arts Television. Um, he's done over 250 interview programs, four documentaries. He's been on NBC, PBS. I mean, it goes on and on uh, in terms of what he does. But again, um, could you tell and share with us why they called you Mad Mike, the mouthpiece of NCA Maniacs. And again, try to tie that to CFC, all right? <laughs> Could you share that with us? I know that's a oh, tough sure. question, but I think you can oh, handle sure. it. sure. You know, um, <clears throat> I'm really glad you, had a, uh, you asked me about that because um, it was an insurmountable task in 1982, 83, 84. But, you know, I did a little research before I came today. Did you realize that um, what we give to charities in the U.S. far surpasses any other industrialized nation in the world? Did you know that the United States helps charities and organizations around the world? Did you know you take all the other contributions from every other industrialized nation and they don't even begin to approach what we give the world? Did you know that? Yeah. And I think... I think, and I look back, and I also, with everything else I do, I, I also teach college English, and I try to inspire these students to believe that not only is the nation great, we're not perfect, but we're pretty close to great when you consider how far we've come in such a short period of time. But I think that um, legacy will show that the U.S. was great and continued to be great because they gave. And every church in America will tell you, for every dollar you give, you get five back. And that's true. That's absolutely true. So I think $800,000 is admirable, but I look around this room and I know all of you are capable of much more. I started at the VA. It was my first job. I worked on the eighth floor in the Manpower Grant Service. Does that service still exist on the eighth floor? Well, it was in 19 for the time out. And I worked. By the way, Mike, he calls you Mr. Baker. Too. Uh, that's good. That's good. Well, we both know we're six months apart in age. Okay. And Tony looks a lot younger than I do. But yeah, I work for Martha Phillips, and I know she's long since retired, and everybody probably in that unit was retired because I was only 23. But um, I was one of the more memorable experiences of my life working in the VA, and um, everybody was wonderful to me. I went over and worked at uh, local headquarters for a while. Then I went into politics. Then I went into television and uh, made a great life. But one of the things that I've always remembered from having worked at the VA is that it's important to give back. And last year was my toughest year. But I decided to do a, a, a video for a charity last year. I spent $4,000 making this video. It's, um, and it's probably on the charity list. It's called the Paul Stefan Home for Unwed Mothers. And I went to a fundraiser, and I saw that they basically were showing these little slides and asking people for money. And I said, gosh, I can make something really pretty for you. Let's just do it. So I made the video for them, and their contributions went up tenfold. They were able to go to events like this and show this video, and the money is flowing in, from what I understand. So it's in times like this, when the country's in its toughest times, that we need to give more to be great again. And I know you'll do that. And I bet you, having worked here at the VA, that you'll far exceed $1 million. I know you will. Um, getting back to what you said about um, college sports, I. I, when I look back, I've been truly blessed as a human being. I've always had a boss that said, go ahead, do it. If you don't, if it doesn't work out, you're fired. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, and it's honest to goodness truth. Um, essentially, I've worked for Tony for 27 years, and he's one of, the, one of the kindest, nicest people I've ever worked for. I've never had a bad boss. Martha Phillips, I tell people... I'd, I'd always rather work for a, a woman than a man. Men are great. They're great in terms of their vision, but women are detail people, and they will always get you where you need to go. Um, and so naturally, I would have rather seen Hillary Clinton as president, but I like Barack Obama as well. Um, in any case, um, detail is very important. And so I've had great bosses. Martha was probably the best I ever had. But I worked for a man who told me, 
I said, look, I tell you, we're in Washington area. There's one basketball game on a week, just one. And I said, this station's got 175 members. It's going under. Let me take $5,000 and buy games from all over the country and put them on the air night after night. And he said, well, these are commercial games. You can't do that. I said, yeah, but you know, at halftime, I can go in there and ask for contributions. And I know I can sell this. He said, fine. $5,000. If you fail, it's your job. Go ahead. Give it a try. So on the first day of the first game, it was Vanderbilt versus Tennessee. We're, we're the day before the game, and I go to the engineer, and I say to him, this is much like the combined federal campaign, when you need help. I go to him, I say, the game is on SATCOM 4. He goes, well, what am I supposed to do about that? I, I said, well, won't we turn our dish? He says, Mike, that's a five-meter dish. He says, that's locked on West, West Star 4. It isn't going to move anywhere. I said, well, I've got games on all these different these, these satellites. I, how am I going to get this? He says, that's your problem. <laughs> so I asked for charity. I got on the phone and I called every satellite dish company I knew and Davis Santana came out and another company came out and they put satellite dishes in the yard to be part of my dream and we did the first game and $1,200 came in. The next game, $3,000 came in, $4,000, $2,000. And we had the game that featured Bobby Knight throwing the chair across the floor. Only people on the East Coast carrying that game on a Sunday afternoon and 5000 came in. Then we got the NCAA tournament. So by the time the smoke cleared, we had UVA um, versus Syracuse and Louisville versus Kentucky in the first round of the NCAA tournament. Do you have any idea how many phones were ringing and how much money came in to a little station that had 175 members? At the end of the year, we had 15,000 members. So basically everybody... So it, we became the little engine that could, and of course Rudy Martsky wrote about me, God bless him, and, and Tony Kornheiser came out one time to do a story on me, and this is a great story. I, I like to brag, people ask me what my legacy is, I got three Tony started in television. So I said, Tony, I said, you're so funny, your columns are so wonderful, why don't you just sit down in the chair and ask for money with Bob Rodwell, who was my associate who started with with Tony, and I said, just sit down in the chair and talk sports and have some, oh, he says, I don't have a face for television. I said, Tony, you gotta trust me. You're gonna be a star. <laughs> he sat down in the chair. I found a reason not to come back for 20 minutes. I made him talk on TV for 20 minutes about anything he could think of. And the next thing you know, look at Tony Kornheiser, Monday Night Football, you know, pardon the interruption, I mean, come on. The guy's a star. So I guess my whole point here is I started with a little station that had never done anything and built it into a sports monster for 15, 20 years. And one thing that I learned is you always put it out there and it will always come back. And I'm telling you folks, for every $5 you give, every $10 you give, I promise you, you will get that back in goodwill. And at the end of your life, I have one little child through another contribution called Usman Fay through the Christian Children's Fund. He's getting ready to celebrate his 16th birthday, and every year they send me a picture, and he's grown a little more, and he's grown a little more. The more you give, the more you get in life. And I swear, you're supposed to give until it hurts. You know that. You're supposed to. Because if there is an eternal life, believe me, you'll all be rewarded for it. So I think you need to think $1 million. That's what I think. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And what we're going to do now, uh, I want to introduce, our, our, there's a, a fifth person that's going to share so, uh, his voice with us. And I know you're counting, and you only see four there, but it's a Mr. John Butler. And um, Mr. Butler, uh, I'm not going to mention the day you were born, even though your bio has your date of birth on there. Uh, but it's in October. He just celebrated a, a birthday uh, on October 14th. And, um, and he is um, someone that has all types of music, extremely talented. I could call you doctor, because uh, he has his PhD. Uh, style covers traditional, inspirational, contemporary, uh, gospel music, jazz, R&B. Um, and um, Carl, who's sitting there next to him, the, the, the gentleman that's following all over the place, that's the person that keeps all of Mr. Butler's money. So if you're looking for Mr. Butler's money, you got to go to Carl, who's sitting there next to him. Um, but I'm going to tell you also, uh, Mr. Butler is an ordained minister. 
Uh, he's a TV host, an author, community activist, a mentor, recording artist, entrepreneur, pastor of the Living Faith Christian Fellowship in Springfield, Virginia, graduate of New Orleans School of Engineering. I could go, again, like everyone here, I can go on and on. Uh, but without further ado, uh, we're going to have a song. That's right. This is a halftime show. You can't have a halftime show without a song. And we're going to get two, but Mr. John Butler. This song is off my latest project. It'll be released this month. It's called The Love Project, and that's why we all are here, uh, because of love, love for one another. The song is entitled, I Love You. I love you are three words that some people never get a chance to hear. And even sometimes when they do, it has no meaning from the one who said, but listen, I love you. These are three words that I want you to hear and know coming from my mouth. Even if you never heard it before, please know that I mean it. From the bottom of my heart And I understand the thought that you've been there May not have ever given you The chance to love back, yeah So please take this moment Don't take this moment for granted when you get a chance to hear a person say, I love you, and I hope that it means a lot, all the things that you've been through, yeah, you don't know what to do, you're so afraid of never hearing anyone say, I love you, and yeah. I care, so I want to say that I love you, and no, I'm not taking it back, because it feels so good just to know that I can love somebody, yeah, and if I can get you to smile for a little while, uh, that says a lot and completes my heart's desire. So go somewhere during this day. I want you to take a moment out of your life and celebrate like never before because you're worth more, more than you'll ever know. That's why I'm here to say I love you in every way.
give it up. Mr. John Butler, give it up. Give it up. Yeah. 2006 Grammy nominee, named musician, Atlas Magazine, 2008 Inspirational Artist of the Year. Uh, thank, thank you, Tony, thank for you. not joining All right. in. Right. <laughs> Y'all give it up one more time for Mr. John Butler. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, what we're going to do right now, Mr. Uh, Ms. Excuse me, Tony has a, a, a couple of words to say, and then he's going to go to some Q and A because no, there's you been. Got it right. You uh, got it right. Oh, Mr. McGee, I've got to <laughs> listen to I got to listen to Donna. Mr. McGee, uh, take it away, sir. You know. Um, I think that song said it all, and that's why we're here. And if you could tell somebody, and if you can show somebody, Absolutely. and you can be involved with somebody, and let them know that you love them. Because it's not, it's not a lot of love out there for individuals right now, because we all have problems. And you know, this campaign will not be successful by luck. Because you know, luck is, to me, is when preparation meets opportunity. That's what luck is. And these organizations are prepared. We just give them the opportunity. And we must continue that. Now, John Butler, he, he was one of the first ones that, of the shows that we brought him on. And he sings with us on the show. But he is very accomplished. And keep your eye out for him because he's very accomplished. But one thing that we are here about, and we're going, we, we are going to take questions and do that, but we want you to know that we are here. And you know, it's, it's just like Emerson said, don't always go where the path may lead, but go where there is no path and leave a trail. Right. And that's what we have to do. Right. That's exactly what we have to do. And you know, we, we come here to be involved with football, but you can take a look at the Washington Redskins now and see, that's why they're not successful right now. They don't have no one stepping up. Mm -hmm. They don't have n everybody contributing. Mm -hmm. Everybody's a self-made athlete there. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be successful this year if they continue that. When Gary and I went, and this team right here, yes, I've been on for 27 years without John and the rest of them I would not have been on. We do it as a team, and that's what you have to do. And a million dollars is not a lot. $12 a month is not a lot. We just ask them for your help. Now, let me go with each comment here. Donna Hopkins, no basketball game at all. <laughs> <laughs> Gary Clark, he dropped five in one game. <laughs> I'm just playing. <laughs> I'm just playing. Mike Baker. That was Cincinnati, it didn't matter. Right. <laughs> Mike Baker, yes, he got Tony into. Uh, he got Tony into uh, uh, television, but why is he talking about Tony Kornheiser? He's been with me for 27 years. <laughs> I'm the Tony he should be talking about. <laughs> but what we want to do now is we, we kind of got to speak in a little longer than we, we probably should have, but we want to take any of your questions. If you have anything about the Washington Redskins, anything uh, uh, about, are you going to allow John to sing another song? Uh, yes, he's going to sing a song right after the Q&A. Okay. Tony, Mr. We McGee. Thank you. Thank you, young man. <laughs> so, any questions you have, please. Yes, ma'am. With CFC, we all have the opportunity to be an MVP by giving of ourselves, giving to wor worthwhile charities. Uh, what would you say are the most important qualities when you're looking at someone who's playing at professional football uh, to be the MVP, uh, what makes that person the MVP? And we're about mid-season, so I want to tie it into sports a little bit too. If you looked across the NFL today and you were selecting an individual to be the MVP, as the teams stand now, who would you pick? Why would you pick them? And what are the qualities you're looking at? I'll let each individual answer that and myself. I stopped looking at MVPs because an MVP is only the byproduct of a team effort. No one can do it by themselves. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I don't really look at MVPs, but if I had to look at certain players to make my team up, 
I use those same three words that I use, commitment, dedication, and sacrifice. Because if you do not do that, you're not going to be successful. And that's what we're asking you to do. As far as team now, Gary, when you look across the NFL, what do you think about the players now? Uh, it's too much pointing, and I see individuals such as if you guys give, and you give to the CFC, you don't have to go out on the street and have a banner up saying I gave or anything. It's just like these guys now. If they make a touchdown, I've seen Gary Clark make tons of touchdowns. He wasn't pointing at himself, and I'm the, you know, you're just doing your job. So when you look at the players now, do you see a lot of that individualism and not working together? Well, yeah, I mean, you, you see that. And I, I'm okay with the guys. With the guys, when they score a touchdown, they're celebrating. And, of course, yeah, as you know, Tony, it's hard. It's hard to get in that end zone. It's <laughs> very, very hard. No, we tried to it's, keep you out of there. It, it's, it's very, very hard to get in that end zone. So as a player, once you get in the end zone, you do want to celebrate because you, you, you've done something good. And I'm okay with that. And, um, and just in today's... Just today's football, quite honestly, it's just, just a little different. I mean, we were brought up in different generations. Um, kids are brought up differently now. Um, we was brought up in a, gener in a generation where um, there's good and bad. You win or you lose. There's really no gray area. If you win, you celebrate. If you lose, you don't celebrate. It's, it's kind of it was simple for us. Um, if you did something wrong, your mother or father disciplined you immediately. <laughs> Uh, they didn't send you in the corner, but with this generation, a lot of times people tend to believe in, you know, what they call timeout. You go in the corner. So for the most part, I think these players in today's NFL truly do want to win football games. They really want to win football games. They just don't hate to lose. Our generation of football players, I hated losing more than I like winning. So for me, I always wanted, I wanted the bragging rights at the end of the day. I wanted to because I had to see Charles Saley of the Cowboys that summer because he lived right beside me. So whoever had bragging rights was going to brag that whole summer about who did what to each other's team. So the mentalities are a little different now. But the guys really do want to win. I just, at some point in time, I don't see anything, I really don't see anything good about losing. I, I, just, I was brought up that way. My father brought me up that way. My mother brought me up that way. And... I, I don't see the things that are good and lose. I don't see any reason why I should have a smile on my face after I just lost a football game. Uh, what, what am I happy about? I, I, I've never quite understood that. And today's athlete, they, uh, they want to go hug their buddy right after the game is won. I can hug my buddy six months later in the summertime when I had time to cool down because I just lost. I don't, I don't want to hug my buddy right now when he just beat my butt. So uh, I just think the mentalities are a little different now. But like Tony, I think... In football or any team sport, the MVP is typically the whole team because I could never, I could have never became a two-time MVP if Mark Rippon or Doug Williams or Joe Theismann couldn't have the time to throw me the pass. I would have been, I wouldn't been able to catch the pass to start with. So I think it is a team sport. It's a team MVP. Another question. We we're running short on time. You can see Steve is on me right now. So anyone, another question. One more. This is gonna be the last one. And that, that kind of goes back with what you were saying, uh, Gary, with, you know, you look at San Francisco, the difference between you got Harbaugh and then you had Singletary. I mean, looking at that guy, that guy would have made me jump up and probably walk again anyway. If he asked, if he stand up and asked me to get up and ask you a question, I probably would have done it. But you know, you, you look at somebody like Mike Singletary that, you know, just seemed to have the right stuff, motivational speaker and everything. And then you look at Jim Harbaugh, was able to motivate the same team, same players to do what they're doing this year, as opposed to the way things went last year. Can you kind of sum that up? I don't know. I, you know. Uh, when you look at the two coaches and, and being around various coaches uh, since I've been covering the Washington Redskins, you look at Norv Turner and some of the coaches have come through, and you look at uh, Joe Gibbs and you say to yourself, what, what made him be able to motivate and turn these teams around? But I think with Singletary, he, he's getting into coaching for the first time. Harbaugh is a coach that's already been there. He understands the process of how to get the most out of each player. Being a player, I think that you have to learn how to trans, you know, uh, 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 go from coaching 
from playing to coaching, and you've got to understand that uh, you're no longer a player, so you're talking to grown men, and Gary and Tony will be first to tell you that when you get into the NFL and you're talking to some of their teammates and so forth, uh, the hardheads and they're making a lot of money and all that, it's a different way that you have to approach the game. And I think that um, Singletary did not approach it in the right way. I think he could have been successful and because he understood the game, but he didn't understand what it takes to be a coach in the NFL. Or it's so, so he, he may have been over his head as far as that, and, and maybe they shouldn't have gave him the starting job because I think that he would have been a better coach as far as coming up the ranks and understanding how to be a coach and what it takes to be a winner. I, th I think he was just too harsh because both both guys are great, but I think Harbaugh is a proven, I mean, he was in the college ranks, in the pro ranks, and, and now, the, with, like you said, the same players that, that uh, Singletary had, he has the same players, but his approach is different. And with CFC, it's the, the approach in going out and getting you know, the contributions and the passion. I, I wanted just to touch on her answer. It's the passion behind anything that you do, the hard work that you put in and so forth is going to get that money for you. Now, Mike, and, and we, we were running out of time, Mike, in, in about 10 seconds. I could do that. Can you tell us the difference you see in the players and the teams from now than when you and I got involved? Yeah, I mean, I um, had the opportunity to go around the locker room with Tony when he first got out of football, and, and um, Gary was, uh, has always been one of my great idols. Um, I think the issue comes down to character. I think, um, not to say that today's players don't have character, but I do agree with Gary. Um, these players are different. It's more about them and the individual as opposed to team. I heard an interview with Aaron Rodgers the other day, and I, I heard a lot of what Tony and Gary are saying in that player. And, um, and I think that's really what it's all about. It's about finding the character, um, the character athlete, and building uh, the locker room around these character athletes. They don't always have to be the most special athletes or the most accomplished ones. But it's the team, ultimately, that wins. It's the team that stops the run. It's the team that knocks the pass down. Yeah, you need a, new a good quarterback, no question about that. And we probably <laughs> should have held on to Donovan McNabb. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but nonetheless, it's really about character, and um, and I tell you, there's one thing that nobody ever said about Gary that everybody knows, and that is Gary hated to lose more than any other player in the NFL. And when Gary made a mistake, which were very few and far between, maybe a pass which was totally uncatchable, uh, and he couldn't have gotten it, <laughs> let me tell you, he really beat himself up. And you need those kind of players to be successful, and you need that kind of a team um, in CFC to pass a million dollars. Let's not even go for a million. Let's go a million two. Let's blow all the other agencies away. Why aren't you shooting for first? All right, this time we'd like to present our guest speakers with the certificates of appreciation. First of all, we'd like to have Mr. McGee. Could you join uh, Mr. Sepulveda out front there? Yes, <laughs> Tony McKinney. The certificates read in recognition and appreciation. It's important to get that. In recognition and appreciation of your participation as featured guests of the Department of Veterans Affairs Central Office 2011 Combined Federal Campaign Halftime Event. Your contribution to the success of this program is greatly appreciated. Mr. Clark, please come forward. I like awards. <laughs> My baby sister. Donna Hopkins, please come forward.
Mr. Mike Baker. Mad Mike. And last but not least, the incomparable Dr. John Butler. <laughs> Dr. Butler, if you could uh, stay there. Uh, my understanding is that by popular demand, folks have uh, asked you for another song. Uh, so, uh, I, I, we need to see some applause. You need to let them know that you want to hear this. So. Okay. Hello. You don't need. One, two, one, two. <laughs> Not today, Todd. We're going to do it tomorrow. This next song is entitled A Family Reunion. And uh, I think it's all about family. Just give me a little bit more of the sound. Hey there, everybody. I know it's been so long. That is why I can hardly wait for us to come together and sing a new song. It's a family reunion. And I can't wait for you to come to town, yeah. Heaven, you should know wherever you go, you know I got your back. As a matter of fact, you and I and us and we, yeah, coming together, being a family, yeah. You and I and us and we, coming together, being a family, yeah. I know it's been so long since we've been apart. Yeah, yeah. Ever since Big Mama, my me and Mama me cross over, ah, we've been singing a brand new song. But listen, but there's one thing you should know. Wherever you go, you know I got your back. Here's a matter of fact, you and I and us and we, yeah, coming together, being a family, yeah, you and I and us and we, ah, coming together, being a family, ah. Get together, have a good day. Yeah. All love. You know, you got to do some rap music in there.